Hello and welcome to Full Disclosure, a podcast project conceived entirely to let me spend more time with interesting people than I would ever get on the radio. And um, Stephanie Beecham, you are one of those people who it is going to be very hard to squeeze into a single hour. (laughs) Well, it's delightful to be here. Let's see how we go. You are Barnett's most famous daughter? Oh, I don't know. I don't know who comes from Barnet. No, nor do I, actually. I thought you'd be the expert. No, I went back and visited Barnet with my sister. We went back to the, the lovely house that we'd been brought up in, and I got a sort of claustrophobia of the suburbs that was frightening. I had to uh, dash away quite fast and get back to dirty, smelly London. Did you have that feeling when you were young? I think so, yes. I always knew that I had to get away as fast as possible. Really? Why? It was too housewifey. Right. It was very middle class. It was too cosy. It wasn't, it just wasn't sharp enough. I knew it wasn't. Gosh. But it was a happy childhood. Desperately. Yes. I mean, n- n- not not a thing to complain about. What? The, the odd chastising nun. But apart from that, no, I mean, it's so cosy, so lovely. Um, and, yes, claustrophobic. Gosh. Um, four siblings, I think. Uh, no, Richard Di, Jenny, Steph. Right, OK. Well, actually, it's Steph, Jenny, but it was Richard Di, Jenny, Steph. I used to be called... Richard so Digeni four of you. Steph. So four, yes. sorry, four, I meant four of you. But that's what my not, father not. called me, Richard Digeni Steph. <laughs> He'd get to my name at the end. <laughs> and were you the baby? Did we, were you, no, we, Jenny no, was. She the was baby, younger than yeah. you, so you didn't. You had that sort of. I had the good part because mm. they Richard was always was always a wonderful person. I mean, he wasn't just a boy scout; he was a queen scout. He wasn't a prefect; he was the head boy. You know, he was that sort. The worst, most flashy thing he ever did was have sort of clocks on his socks, if you know what I mean. Yes. You no, know, no, he was totally full on straight. And then my elder sister Di Di, probably my best friend, um, actually my best friend. Um, and uh, uh, my guru, really, she's just so wonderful. Um, she seemed to be turning out fine and was a member of the Young Conservatives. And so I was just allowed. I was, I just, I, I, I oh. escaped. I so vanished. They'd, they'd covered respectability. They'd and you were therefore free to flourish in whatever directions you chose. I could just dash about and nobody seemed to know. I did get uh, sent home from school for having green hair once. Deliberately? No, no, no. It was, I meant to go black, yes. but unfortunately, having had sort of dyed blonde, and I was very young, it had gone green. And the nuns didn't like it? It wasn't nuns then. This was... This was um, This was grammar school. This was Queen Elizabeth Girls Grammar School who thought it was Cheltenham Ladies College, and why not? (laughs) So you were bright then to get into grammar school. You obviously were good at your classes. I think so, probably, but became incredibly disinterested. Completely? In in all academic pursuits? You must have liked drama or, or, or English literature or something like that. I loved English. Yes. I could have lived in the art room. Okay. It smelt right. Yes. And we had two wonderful art teachers. And if Mrs. Zabel liked your lino cut, she would ask if you would put it all over a piece of fabric and the next week she'd be wearing it as a skirt. That was Mrs. Zabel. That's exciting. Yeah. And then we had a really, really hip... Um, uh, art teacher also and I cannot remember her name and she taught us how to draw the space not the object so that you drew the space between so you would look and you would draw the space and that's and I've been so grateful for those things um uh forever because then you can see things for that space Mm. 
and therefore the balance of things and where you should put things. So I, I had I had a I, I had a wonderful education. Our our um, Latin teacher was D. F. Kitto's uh, niece, I think, and Kitto had done most of the translations of most of the plays, mm. um, and I had very. Very good. I remember what somebody pulling me to one side and said, "You don't like exams, do you?" I said, "No." I said, "Do you know the only way to really show that you have the right to say you don't like this uh, exams?" And I said, "No." <laughs> and she said, "By passing them all very well uh. and then saying you disapprove." Oh, that's a clever thing. It's that's very a, clever. That's a clever thing to. So, in other words, I cannot complain about my uh, education, and I'm sure that they should have complained about my green hair. Did you? Did you? I mean, did the show off gene kick in while you were at school, or rather, the look at me gene? Did you? Did you perform oh, there? The which, look at me gene. Which you must have. Wasn't um, you? Uh, yes, I mean, I didn't want to be uh, very, 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 very young. I did not want to be cast as Chanticleer the Cock in the Nativity play. Who's ever heard of Chanticleer well, the quite, Cock? Quite in the even now. Play? I wanted to be Mary. Yes. And I was really disappointed, and also... So you were cast as Chanticleer the Cock? I was you remember cast the... as... Cl- well, of course I remember, because my mother had to make the costume, and she had to make the... What is it called? Oh, I need. I had it in my head then when you said it. It's a funny word, isn't it? It's what not. Is it's it? not a coxcomb. It's well, not, we'll call it a coxcomb. Yes. But anyway, this thing was made out of felt and looked like it should have been successful, but it didn't. It fell. It, mm. So it was a, flaccid. A lopsided. You had a flaccid coxcomb. I had a flaccid coxcomb at the age of whatever it was. <laughs> no. No, I, I, I had some terrible, I, another dreadful experience, which definitely didn't give me the show off gene. But I think probably I've been making up for it ever since. All right. So I'm four years old, French-speaking convent. Right. Reverend Mother is going off on her holiday, on a sabbatical. She's going to France. I am picked. I am selected to take her up a bunch of flowers before she leaves and and to say au revoir bon voyage I'm four au revoir bon voyage is the complete canon of Shakespeare I mean it's 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 a desperate thing to have to remember and but a bunch of flowers take them up reverend mother should be all right should be all right so the big smelly girls. I always thought big girls were smelly. The big smelly girls and my sister was saying, you know, it's all right and it's new, exciting and your sandals are new and everything. <laughs> yes, new sandals. So I'm given the flowers. They're, they are gladioli. Right. They are as tall as I am. Yes. I am going up the steps in new sandals. With giant flowers. Triffids. With giant flowers, with triffids, with triffids. And I trip. Oh, no flat there's an <gasps> oh coming from the crowd my embarrassment my everything I get up the stairs I shove these gladioli at the reverend mother totally forget I meant to say anything and dive into her skirts oh. I think after that, I might never have wanted to present myself in public again. <laughs> or maybe I've just simply been making up for it ever since. Trying to claw back. <laughs> so when did it kick in then? When would you first be conscious of wanting to to be to be on stage? When would you? When, when? I They were doing a school play and they wondered if I wanted to be in it. How old were you now? Um, 14, so okay. 13, yes. 14, 14. I'm 14. And uh, I said, what's the name of this? No, no, well, you wanted me to play Chrysothemus? Mm. Chrysothemus, okay. Uh, well, what's that? Uh, what's the name of the play? Electra. I said, no, I'll do that one. And I did. They can, they gave you the part. And my s- elder sister has been waiting for me to be that good ever since. <laughs> <laughs> so did you, I mean, you... you people said good grief she's very 
I don't know what people said. But your sister but, did. Well, she did. Uh, but I do know that I felt something uh, that was totally extraordinary. And I was Electra. Right. Sweet light, sweet air. I can remember the walking on stage and with those f f couple of words first off and it was as if suddenly a world had opened up that was just magic there was just a magic world this world where you could go and be not play be somebody else and hasn't left me yet. No. Were you aware then that it was a... Because I sense already that you were unlikely to settle down with a doctor in Barnet and and join the doctor. Well, I, I but took you were me, aware. it took me till I was over 60 to find my doctor. <laughs> of course it did, yes. <laughs> and not in Barnet. But I, what I mean by that is that you were, you were clearly not going to follow... The, the sort of preordained paths for, for young women of your class and background. You, ah, you... well, my class was an interesting thing because Mummy had come from a family where her father had been, uh, had lived with his five sisters, I mm. think it was, um, and they were all people that had never married because all the young men had been killed in World oh, War gosh, I. Yes. So one of the sisters had been the first person to play solo piano at the Albert Hall. I've got another sister's painting over my bed. It's the most, I mean, you wouldn't believe it wasn't an old master. The fruit is so extraordinary and alive. So in other words, a very talented family of women. Mummy came, that was she was the daughter of. Mm. And, um, and Mummy ha was... I mean, she knew nothing of life. Okay. And I don't think she ever really did much. So that she, anything I said I wanted to do, she just said, that sounds all right. Okay. I mean, at the age of 12, I said to her, how much does it cost to keep me for a month? <laughs> uh, and this was in the summer holidays. And she said, I don't know, about a pound a day. I said, so a month would be 30 quid, would it? Yeah. Can I have 30 quid and I want to go away for a month? And I hitchhiked, I mean, with friends, down to the south of France. It didn't quite last out. My parents had to come down to Folkestone or somewhere because we got onto the boat coming back without yes. a ticket. But they didn't let us off. <laughs> so the port authorities or whoever it was had us uh, under lock and key until my parents came down and rescued but, you. So, yes. so, so there was never so. So I would have thought that, that this suburban claustrophobia that you felt would have would have balked against any thespian ambitions. But no, in fact, I mean, it, there it, weren't thespian. There were no thespian. So when did ambitions. that kick in then? Oh, that was that wasn't. A, so I okay having a good look at myself and so, deaf people. We haven't mentioned that, no, but you were okay, born deaf in one year. but yeah. this is really important. Of, to this bit of your story. No, it's really important to the whole. To everything. It's, it's absolutely, I think that I have underestimated how huge yes. being mono hearing has been. And in terms of preferring my own company to being in crowds, never sitting at the centre of a table, always mm. I'm, I'm on that corner. So that person I can see and everybody else I can hear. Um, and spending years of embarrassment of never telling anybody and therefore not really hearing and pretending that I wasn't interested and therefore being rather snooty and aloof. Mm. And really I was just, I couldn't hear yeah. and I was embarrassed. But anyway, so a lot of stuff going on. And so I thought one of the things that I didn't like about deafness was a sort of clumsiness 
and it, there was no, there was no, they, they didn't seem to be lookers. And I thought I wanted to teach deaf people to present and to dance. And that's what I thought I was going to do. And I love dancing, uh, ballet. I mm. did ballet, 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 ballet. I didn't even do, I wasn't allowed to, to go to um, uh, girl guides because uh, I was doing ballet five nights a week. And uh, I was never going to make a ballerina. I, I was turned down by the Royal Ballet School at the age of 10. That's because of the death. Huge trauma. Yes. No, because I was too sort of porky and my feet weren't beautiful enough. I was never going to I was never going to have beautiful arches. Porky and being the, a relative term in these Well, I know, but when you're wearing one of those white things and there's, there's these little people with their hair also done in a nice bun yes. and they and they and they're looking like little waifs and and I'm looking rather stolid and oh, and, and and my belt's a bit tight. <laughs> You know, I'd pulled my tummy in when they had made this pink <laughs> buckram belt. Oh dear! So and I got turned down, right. which was the best thing that could ever have happened to yes. me. Yes, but you still wanted to to dance. I wanted to teach and to teach dancing. Yes, but yes. teach deaf people to dance because I realised that you can feel through the vibration, you can hear through the vibration of a bouncy floor. So that it, that I felt that if I could give a sense of rhythm to this floor, I could teach deaf children to dance. And I went to study mime mm. in Paris um, with Etienne, Etienne de la Croix. Etienne de Croix? Etienne de la Croix. I can't even remember. Etienne de la Croix. <laughs> um, and he taught Marcel Marceau. Right. And when you somebody asked about Marcel Marceau and... Etienne said, il est mort, il n'existe plus, because he had, uh, he doesn't even exist, yes. because, um, uh, uh, what's his name, had used uh, props. Oh, okay, so he'd ceased to be a yeah. proper, he'd, he'd, he was no longer. He'd polluted the purity absolutely, of the medium. Absolutely, We used to have to do homage au coquillage, Every morning, this was in. There was a, there was a, there was a thing, a, a, an alcove, with a shell in it. Yes. And of course, this being the radio, you can't see what I'm doing. Well, they can I'm, actually. I'm, oh, I see. Yes. I'm, <laughs> I am holding my arms in a shell position. Okay, that's yes. a shell position, which is both giving and receiving. Right. And so, homage au coquillage. And then we had to do these... To I mean, I am very good at, at, at uh, total dislocation of each part of my body, because you did it for three quarters of an hour every morning. Right. Um, and then I got fired from my au pair job. Because I was the worst au pair in the world. So you were, you were I was doing the lessons in mime and supporting yourself by being an yes, au pair. I yes. see. But I was a rubbish au pair. Yes. Rubbish. Why were you so bad at it? I didn't care. Didn't, I mean, did you not like the children? Je vais faire le this yes. little boy Lionel used to say. And I'd say, OK, honey. And I would put him in front of the Punch and Judy show and go off with friends and have coffee. Now, the Spanish maid caught on to this and realised I was rubbish. The family Fantastic. didn't, because I sat at dinner and was very good and, and knew how to do everything. But the maid me. had your number. But the maid had my number, and she hit me over the head. <laughs> she hit me over the head with a boot. And we had a right old going, because she knew that I was a phony, which I was. Uh. Now, they never thought I was a phony, but it was a diplomatic family, literally, because it was a very posh part of Paris. Um, uh, they, they, they gave me tons of Chanel number no. five and sent me back to England. Right. And I went up... So how old are you now? So it was 64 17. when you came... I'm 17. So you're 17 years old. So I'm you, 17 you years old. So you didn't do A-levels. You didn't... You went off I to I did B one year of A-levels. I did English it. and art. Right. Got them. Chuck. Oh, OK. Didn't care. I was doing five A-levels. But if I'd met you then and I'd said to you what, you, what do you want to do when you grow up? You'd have said, I want to teach dance to deaf children. Yes. And that dream got taken away from you now really now because yes. I went up to not uh, to Liverpool to visit a friend um, a boyfriend really mm. uh, to visit a boyfriend um, who was building the stage of the Liverpool Everyman gosh and I went into Hope Hall which was a place where down in the basement three nights a week 
um, everybody played. Beatles had happened, so this is what? This must be mm. 65, I suppose, I know, something yeah. like that. Um, and uh, I guess it must be 65. Yes. I, I, can't, I can't even do the maths, but I think it would be. Anyway, the Beatles had happened. The cavern was huge. Um, uh, I was, uh, it was Liverpool. It was really alive. Get her with the fur, her. Um, you know, I was, I, I was <laughs> and I thought, this is theatre. This is theatre. I'm going to do it. And I auditioned with a piece of O-level um, uh, English, uh, uh, Juliet. Right. Gallop a pace, you fiery footed steeds towards Phoebus lodging such a... For, you know, for a specific part or just for the company in no, general? No, to be... To, be to uh, join dog's the company. Body, to, dog's right, body. Okay, so ASM type. ASM Juve lead. Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. I was fired as an ASM within 24 hours for being a distraction. It's becoming a recurring theme, being yes. dismissed from these yes. roles, these, these roles. So, so, so fired from ASM and I was sent into the wardrobe. Right. <laughs> where I was working with, with lovely Anthea, who wore the sort of, I don't know, uh, I, I mean, at the time, and you can tell how I mean, it was awful, but I just felt she was like a wronged nun from the Belgian Congo. You know, this was a sort of, this was a very, so I, so I had to not be naughty. Yes. Very good for uh, amazing sewing skills, and and all my art stuff was kicking. It in. was it was lovely, mm. and then oh gosh, dash! I've I've got a I've got a a, a matinee. You know, it was uh, so dashing off to do the matinee and play, oh, an old 70-year-old woman in the in the crowd scene from Henry IV. But I was also doing the Juve leads. Right. Cleriche in Servant of Two Masters. That was the first part I did. Gosh, yeah. You know, so I was... D fab... I can go on. Well, no, well I, I hope you do. I, but I, 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 I need to join the dots, Stephanie. I, I, <laughs> I, just because I can't quite see the, the, the this. You've, you've described it in such sort of effortless terms that you essentially decide that you've had enough of school and then you end up in Paris where you were enrolled. But you see, I didn't know. And my mother is was a genius at this. Hmm. I didn't know that anything was hard to do. Ah, I see. And this is where your mother's I background want, kicks in because her it. aunts could do anything and the, so there the, were no obstacles. So did my mother. Why not? Now, Why not go to Paris and join a prestigious mime school? Because uh, uh, your, uh, yes. your cousin is there and she she's... Uh, can't even, you know, so, so slide she, in there. We'll get you a job with a diplomatic family. You'll be an au pair. It. That hasn't worked out. You'll pop up to Liverpool, join a theatre company. I mean, it is what? extraordinary. We, we, you, you, you weren't aware at the time that this was. You were almost living a novel, weren't you? Yes, uh, but you see, I didn't know that unhappiness existed till about the age of twenty-nine. Oh. Um, I. Uh, I can really imagine. Well, I did know unhappiness existed. You know, I did. I well, only, taken... only as a concept, not as an experience. Well, yes, as a like. I think I'm so unhappy because he didn't phone. <laughs> I'm taking twelve paracetamol, and the worst thing that happened after that suicide attempt at the age of twelve was that my hair. Uh, hadn't been put in rollers uh, that night and therefore wasn't quite as uh, bouffant as it should have been. I mean, this was all pretend, mm. all pretend. I didn't have d f full blown, God, is yeah. this what life can be? Hell until till I was a mum. Because you, you were living this sort of... S s s I want, I'll get. Well, I'll and, do and that, it, and, I'll do the work. And next on the list then is Rada. So you do, I think... Ah, nine, but this nine, is another story. This is, this, is, this, is, this is another one. That's, yes. So a lot of the people that had started the Liverpool Everyman had come from Rada. Mm. Terry Hans, Susie Fleetwood, um, uh, uh, Terry Taplin, a lot of them, all Rada... Were you in awe of people, or did you just treat everyone as an equal? How, how, how did you? How did seventeen-year-old, eighteen-year-old you behave in the presence? Well, Susie of Fleetwood, who was actually Mick Fleetwood's sister, is that uh, right? Susie Fleetwood. Um, uh, was she very uh, tall? Yes. <laughs> Susie Fleetwood. I went into the dressing room, 
and she said hello shitty face your place is there okay and I said thank you and um, and then she would uh, in a red bra and knickers sit on my boyfriend's lap and I would get her a cup of tea it's funny the things you remember but it's just you see I did it didn't nothing it was that is what happens right. here so yes. that's what happens here wasn't it was just everything was magic it sounds like it yes it sounds I, like I could have that could have been a big thing couldn't it some gorgeous girl in her red underwear sitting on my, no it just was not was do you want sugar in your tea you know it was it was well it's the opposite mother. it's the opposite of claustrophobic suburbia isn't it these are just exciting remarkable. mind you mind you uh, 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 the bed that I made was on was a, a mattress I suppose I had to be on a wooden thing then mm. but it was you know those huge beer cans mm. that get left behind after parties I mean they're that fat party sevens or party eights. I don't know yes. but anyway they don't four exist of the anymore, no but they did then yes no I know four of those as the legs uh, were the legs greased so the mice couldn't get up Good Lord, really? Yeah. So it wasn't all glamour then? No, <laughs> no. But, and I was terrified of mice, terrified of mice. I really, really, really didn't like mice. No. I mean, so that was, that was, the I other mean, side. I was earning £7.50. Right. And the rent was £2. Okay. Which actually, in today's uh, uh, stuff, a quarter of your wa wages being rent is is really very good um but i didn't eat out as they say i didn't actually eat after wednesday we got paid i think on thursday lunchtime and so one time my birthday was on a thursday and i was the one that had to make the tea coffee whatever nescafe whatever it was done. and and auntie peggy had sent me biscuits for my birthday and i put them there for, and by the time i came back with the coffee the whole Flaming cast has eaten them all. Outrageous, the outrageous the behaviour. So, so you become aware of Rada through your association with. Oh these, no, sorry, I've people. got to get. I've got to get back. Fernald came up. John Fernald right. ran Rada. Right. And he said, "What have you done?" And I said, "You saw it tonight." Mm, that's it. And he said, uh, "And what are you going to do?" And I said, "I'm going to Rada because Terry Hand says I need technique." Right. And he said, oh, are you? Is that what he says? He said, well, we better come and see me then. I said, yes, that's why I'm talking to you. Again, not even awed in any way or, or I mean, just all seemed perfectly normal, straightforward, na well, that's natural what had progression. To happen. That's, Na that's what, had what I'm to happen. doing next, yes. of course. Yes. And you did. Yes. So you enrolled there. Well, no, you have to pass... Uh, well, I know you have to audition. And, yes. And, and it's quite... But, but I sense you perhaps weren't aware of how hard it was to get in. Were you? No. No. And then you got in and you yes. still weren't aware of how hard it was to get in. And you did two years there, I think. Yes, but I left a term early, of uh, course. Yes, that's what I'm just calculating. And I met Miss, I met Miss Maynard, who is my English teacher, um, from uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth's. Mm. And, and she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm leaving, rather. She said, Stephanie, will you never finish anything? Because I hadn't finished my A-levels. No. And I thought, yeah, but there's no point because I looked at the gold. I've looked, Miss Maynard, I've looked at the winners of the gold medal, which is the only reason to stay on for the last term because I've got seven agents ask, offering me to you know, be with them. And, and I'm only going to go with the one who saw me in the um, checkoff because obviously I didn't care about anybody who chooses me from being a hot box dolly in uh, uh, that musical. There's, there's no point in going with them, so I'm going with it. So, so, and there's no point because I've looked at the gold medal list and apart from one name, Anne Bancroft, I've never heard of any of them. So what's the point in being on that list? How funny. Who, who, who were your peers? Who were your contemporaries when you were there? Um, well, the older boys, Ken Cranham. Oh, yeah. Now, I'd known Ken Cranham from the National Youth Theatre. Oh, we've skipped that. I didn't know you'd done that. So, yes. so, so this is, so w w when you touched on the deafness and how important it was, I, s I think the bit we've missed is you may have had ambitions and ideas, but you wouldn't have thought you'd be able to do 
these things, perhaps. You wouldn't have thought that a career as an actress... Didn't think about being an actress. No, it wasn't open to you. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. I didn't think about it. It wasn't that it wasn't open. Just it wasn't something that I thought... Didn't would, come into your head? Not really. But the National Youth Theatre did, because that sounded like a really great wheeze. And mm. they, they, so I went up to Eccleston Square, and I was 12, mm. and I said I was 15. Yes, I was going to say, that was very young. Yes, I was 12, and me and my friend Roz did... And um, and I asked Rosie how her audition thing, her interview had gone. And she said, oh, it's good, it's good, it's good. He said, um, she, he, they said, who's your favourite actor? And I said, Alfred Finley. And I said, I don't think that's his name. <laughs> and it's, 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 she didn't get in. Um, and I was asked oh, if I was going to join the National Youth Theatre, um, what I wanted to do. And I said... I, I, I'm open. And they said, well, do you want to be on admin or LX? Right. And I said, oh, um, LX. I didn't know. I, no, I thought I didn't know what they were talking no. about. <laughs> and I was the only person that had a complete fuse of the whole of Scala Theatre. Um, In King's Cross? No. Yes, well, yes the, that King, that was that's where we were. For oh, okay, the, I didn't for, know that. They yes, just made a documentary about it. Oh, really? But not that era, from when it was a sort of outre cinema. No, this was, was probably before that. It was wasn't before it? that. Yes, yes, it was. This was. Before this that. was um, and uh, yes, I had a complete. I had a complete. So you've done so. Anyway, much, I, mean, I met. I met Ken Cranham then. Back so then. Cre 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 Ken was. Right. And Peter Egan was. Yes. And um, and then uh, uh, in my. Uh, lots of very lovely people, and one my best friend, my she 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 and I thought we were snoots, and I realised that she was blind, and she realised I was deaf, and then we became best friend. And she uh, her name was Sandra Duncan, and she was a very famous actress in uh, South Africa. Right after, uh, so I. Uh, so you've you so you're leaving you're leaving a term early because you've got representation. You, yeah. What I mean, we, we haven't talked about ambition really, apart from wanting to teach ballet to deaf children. But, but by now, were you competitive? Did you look around at Rada and think I want? Because you, you, yes, I must have. I must have been because yes. because Linda Bergthorsen, who <laughs> who you know as Linda Thorson. Yes. I. I can remember saying to her. Will you get off the stage, you pushy cow? Right. Now, she was probably my only competition okay. when I really look at it. And she's not a pushy cow. She's a really nice girl. But you wanted... Apparently, I was, she was getting in the way. You wanted, to, her wanted legs the spotlight. You and, wanted to and, get... So no, it wasn't that. I wanted to get my steps done. Right. I don't... I think that people who are deaf are quite isolated. Now, uh, I'm not saying okay. we're just... Uh, self-thinking we see a lot mm. but we don't it's it's almost like a solo path through space yes because uh, I don't know there is an isolation that happens very very young I used to take a lot of days off from school mm. when I was really young and sometimes I would say to a nun I am not very well. Right. It wasn't true. I was tired of listening. And she'd say, go to the library. And I used to sit and just sit down in the library and look at all the stuffed birds that were all round the library and have a quiet time. It was self-care, actually, yeah. to use a modern lingo. Was. Is that You somehow needed, subconsciously knew that you needed. had to... To be alone. To step back from the... Yeah. Cause, because it was much more exhausting for you to so keep tiring. up. So tiring. It must have been. Makes acting an odd choice in some ways. Why? I know my lines. I know their well, lines. Well, no, but I was about to say an <laughs> obvious one in others because everything makes sense. Everything yeah. has a time and a place. I'm yeah. almost thinking of the... Hamlet talking to the players about, yes. you know, each has their entrances and exits. Yes. And, um, and And now we reach the point fairly swiftly... Uh, uh, at which people listening to this, people watching this, become aware of you, depending on their age. Because straight out of Rada, you're into the Queen's Traitor, I think, at the BBC. Um, so I'm playing Mary Queen of Scots. Yes. And Susan Engel, 
is playing Queen Elizabeth. Susan Engel is very tall. I am not very tall. Mary Queen of Scots was tall. Yes. Elizabeth. So the lovely people had to take their shoes off when they were working with me and wear those rather high heel 16th century things um, when they were working with Susie. Uh, and we, we shared a flat together and uh, 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 she was, she's a wonderful so this was a person. big, a big part in a big production, and pretty much your first job was it? Yes, I think my first job was a three-hander with Nigel Stock and Avis Bunnage, um, which was a film. Isn't that wonderful, Nigel Stock and Avis <laughs> Bunnage? Um, and, and that was a complete delight. And it was because I swore in French then. Uh, just uh, How when sophisticated. I sophisticated. <laughs> They, he thought so. Yes. Brandon Acton Bond, his name was, the right. director. And he thought so, and that's why he cast me as Mary Queen of Scots. Is that right? Yep, because, Gosh. of course, she was French. And, and and you don't really look back, do you? I mean, so I've got highlights now. So two, two and a half years later, you're doing the games directed by Michael Winner. But I, I sense... Yeah, but look, I, I went to... I was at... I did the British... Um, keep going French on you. I did the Jean Ennui uh, uh, Monsieur Barnett at for um, Bristol Old Vic. Right. And I did a whole load of things at the uh, Oxford Playhouse. So there's a I've done at least 65 plays. But this is the thing, isn't it, with you? Because people who know you, whether it's from the, 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 um, the Colby's or Coronation Street on screen or films like The Nightcomers, you, you, you are an actress who always goes back to the stage. You, yeah. You, you, you know, at every step, so before You, you and mustn't after, kick and what makes you... Uh, no, the stuff that what opens pays doors. The, exactly, what what yes. pays the f school fees. You mustn't. Um, but I would like to be known as a national theatre player and a Royal Shakespeare artist, yes. uh, both of which I... I mean, I can remember, I can remember, I thought the next play I'm going to do, I've got to be at the Royal Court. OK. And, where it was uh, all happening. Where it was it? all yeah. happening. And Bill Gaskill was running the Royal Court. And uh, he, I had an interview with him, and he said, you really are not my kind of actress. Ooh. And I thought, well, I mustn't swear. But I did think those words. Do it in French. And, uh, <laughs> and um, uh, or I'll do it in Italian, che mm. cazzo. Um, uh, so I, I, I was really, 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 really cross. Mm. And of course, I was even more determined that I would work at the Royal Court, but I did, but only when Stuart Burge took over. And then I did an amazing play with some wonderful people um, uh, called uh, London Cuckolds. And it hadn't been done for 300 years, so no one had ever seen it. And it was it was Ken Cranham and How was it? Alf, oh, Mike how. Elphick. Right. Mike Elphick, my He's a God. brilliant actor. Oh, my God, Mike Elphick. You go out at, with Mike Elphick. You know, yes. when I say out, I mean really out. Sure. And uh, with, with that lot, Brian Prothero, there were such nice people. But Mike Elphick would borrow a tenner off you at two in the morning and you knew that he wouldn't get home. No. And then we were all doing it again. Anyway, brilliant. Happy days. Yeah. Um... And then, and then I, I guess, I mean, what do you look back on as being the sort of big moments? Because you were working with Brando by 1971, weren't you? Yes. So, but that wasn't, or was it? I mean, was that? Did you have any sense of rungs on the ladder? Did you have any sense? No, of, no, no, no sense at all, and I never have had. No, I didn't think I, so. I think now I have much more understanding that I thought, oh dear, I, 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 it's almost as if now, at the age of <laughs> nearly 77. That, that I'm thinking, you know, my next move should be, and I thought, <laughs> you finally why, started didn't planning. You, why didn't you think about what your next move should have been? It, 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 instead of just being, I didn't come from a theatrical background. No. I didn't know anything. And 
I mean, for example, the nightcomers just mentioned Brando. Well, I told Mummy phoned me, and I said, "Oh, Mummy, I'm sorry. I've been so busy." Um, uh, and she said, "Well, good, good. But darling, what, so what are you doing?" I said, "I am going to be, <coughs> I'm going to be co-starring with Marlon Brando." <laughs> and she said, "Oh, darling, Brandy Marlowe, how exciting! I must tell Auntie Molly." <laughs> Never heard of him. But you, but you say this. What but do you also, mean I say this? My but, father but about said, planning. I mean, oh, but, yes. but actually, you were having a, a, a wonderful adventure all the time. It sounds. It I haven't really, stopped yet. You never really stopped to. I haven't stopped to yet. plot. No, because everything was so much fun. Um, I love this story. I know you've told it before, but I wonder if you'd share it with us again about the the sort of gallant side of Marlon Brando and how he sort of protected you from um, the the nudity. Oh, look. The, Marla, Marla, uh, 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 when I very, very, very first met him, uh, uh, I mean, I can tell you the whole story. I said that I'm only going to do work with Marlon. I said to Michael Winner, if I have a date with him first. And Michael said, my dear, what are you talking about? I have never known anybody like you in my life. So you, I not only offer you the role of a lifetime opposite the greatest actor in the world, but you are now saying that you will not deign to work with him until you have had a date with the gentleman. Well, I will put that in my thinking cap and I will come back to you. OK, came back to me. Yes, we'll go to the movies. He wants to see a John Ford movie. So I turn up late uh, because I couldn't get a taxi and I'm all in a thing and I can't even look at this person called Marlon Brando. I can't even look at him. And there's John Trevelyan there who is the censor. Now, we were chatting up John Trevelyan, supposedly that's what, mm. because we didn't want it to get a terrible, 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 hard right. double X yes. rating. And um, they were talking about Zen Buddhism and I peeped up with something. I, you know, I said something. And John Trevelyan just went over the top I mean like didn't hear it right and suddenly this paw came over and held mine and it was Marlon because if anybody was embarrassed or put down or in any way made to feel lesser mm. he was there now you be naughty and you be cheeky and you be well, he would have a farting cushion on your thing, you know. I mean, he was he was he was full of games, yes. but he had a, he oh that man, he had um, oh a friend, yeah, uh, very it knowing Marlon is like claiming to be friends with an a very large animal hmm. because total instinct there was no intellect there right it was it was he smelt the air in the morning and knew how things were good sense of humor wonderful sense of humor wonderful sense of the ridiculous but basically a wild untamed animal like a bear and when his son Christian was went to prison, I realized that Marlon was the unhappiest man who had ever lived. Failure as a father, mm. failure, you know, so many things. And I phoned him and I said, what can I say? I feel like a bunny rabbit trying to talk to a bear in the forest. <laughs> but I'm here if you want to talk to me. And he phoned me every day. And one day he phoned, usually you would phone me in the middle of the night. Right. And, uh, but he phoned me uh, when I was going on stage in the vortex. Mm. And, and he didn't l let go. And I said, Marlon, I've got to go. I'm going to be late on stage. And uh, and and then he's wandered on more. And I said, I, I'm. I've got to go. I was late. Mm. And afterwards, the cast, the, the the people that I'd held up, and I'm, you know, it's really annoying mm. that 
said, why? What, you know, wh okay, what? I said, I'm sorry, but Marlon wouldn't put the phone down. And they looked at me and said, well, for a good excuse, that's it's not, not a bad, bad is it? It's not bad. <laughs> but the, <laughs> that's, that's just to make a joke of what really wasn't a joke. Of course. Um, and he looked after you on set as well, didn't he? he looked oh, sorry, he yeah. was simply wonderful. Why are you wearing those ridiculous, huge Y fronts? I've never seen a pair of Y fronts. This is you talking big. to him, um, not no, him talking no, to no, you. No, 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 <laughs> no, I wasn't wearing the Y fronts. I had nothing on underneath my dressing gown whatsoever. Right. And he knew that. And so he didn't trust Michael Winner's taste. Mm. And he knew that he could only protect me by wearing Wellington boots and huge Y fronts. So that the camera couldn't pan so down. So the camera, so my tits could go everywhere, but that's all, just from the waist up. <sighs> and um, and then you're off, really, aren't you? Tenko, I suppose, is the next no, 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 then I get blacklisted from Hollywood. Oh, so this is because of a Playboy shoot that you didn't want to do? Yes, this is but I'm so cussed, you see. Of no, course. what it really was, was Joseph E. Levine had bought... The Nightcomers. Yes. And I was in New York, as you are. I was in New York, staying in the penthouse of the Sherry Netherland, as you do. And uh, it was, I was just found out to be there. And, and, and so that uh, suddenly I had to meet uh, Josephine Levine, of course. Because yes. no one had taken me to, to New York. And they just conveniently found me there. Do right. you see what I mean? Yes, I, was, I do. Uh, yes. uh, so so t too cool for school. Um, and uh, uh, I mean, God, I've had so many encounters. You but have. anyway, uh, so he summons you. So he, he, so he invite you know, I'm there, and I go and see a film that I didn't like very much, which was French Connection. I said it was too violent, and he had just bought that or just made that or something. And then he said, "Okay, now you will do tomorrow the Johnny Carson show." I said, "I won't." Mm. Now instead of saying, "Oh, I don't." have a hairdresser I don't have clothes with me I don't have I don't know what to do uh, and in which case he'd say oh I'm sure we could you know but I didn't I was far too sort of ah oh, what was I I mean if I, I, the best advice I could ever give anyone is if you don't know ask right yes and I didn't ask I said no right and then he said, uh, you do uh, Playboy? I said, no, 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 She was nude in the film. That's not me. Okay. I'm not doing. Mm. Of course, later, just because I'm cussed, I did it. Um, uh for my own fun. Yes. I mean, what stubbornness. I didn't understand. I was frightened of producers. They wore suits and had ties on. Which was not a world you'd had much experience no. of at any point. And it's when I think you're talking to Sam Peckinpah about straw dogs that, mm -hmm. that you find out word He said, I'm spread. a son of a bitch and I can't employ you, yeah. is what Sam Peckinpah said. You must have really done something... Uh, uh, to f f the fact that I'm a I'm a son of a bitch and I can't and employ, I can't employ you. you. Yeah, because he wouldn't get the money to make the films that he needs. Well, he needed he no the I mean, approval. He, the, he, the, he the could, whole, but he just wasn't allowed to. The whole nine years. Isn't that so interesting? It is very interesting. Mm. I, I, I mean, it, it's a, a sort of weird form of blacklisting, but it makes sense, doesn't it? Well, I didn't get back to Hollywood. Yeah. Until I went with television in right. the eighties. So back to Britain. And I want to. I want to get a bit to what what the plan is now. As, as, plan, as you touch, no, no, no. I mean, you just said that at this stage, right at the now, oh. you finally started thinking. We've got two films that we need to talk about, and we're going to run out of time. Oh, really? But, but well, we've reached the bit now where people are aware of you because, I suppose, coming back to Britain, more stage, more lots more theatre, TV, film, Tenko and Connie were the. Bit. I was broke. You're I right. was completely broke. Um, but not your spirit. Oh, there was Were a time. Down days? There was a time when I actually didn't think it would. I thought everybody might be better off without me. There was definitely. Uh, it was awful. So awful, this is when awful, you discovered unhappiness. Sadness. This is what yeah, you meant when yeah, you said really, you really, really, really awful. You felt like it had. You'd had it in, all within your grasp, and it had all just gone away. I can remember watching. Um, 
uh, some television program, rock, rock, Follies. Rock, rock Follies. Yeah. And I thought, oh, I used to be a human being. One of those. Yes. And I had two babies. Mm. And I, I didn't know what to do. I mean, I had a f play I wanted to do and a film I didn't want to do <laughs> and £2,000 worth of bills. And I did Enseminoid. Right. Great wonder of a film. But I, there was nothing for it. I mean, I had to, I had no money. I had no means of, it was, it was an amazing learning time, but it was a it was a, a learning uh, with your with your fingers yeah. uh, scratched and just seeing over the edge and thinking I haven't got the energy to get there and thinking I got to get there I got to get over the edge I got to because of babies I mean I don't think I would have done anything if it hadn't been because for you kids. weren't just responsible for yourself so I would right. to, to avoid the amateur psychology this is the first time really you had to fight for stuff fight for survival really get over the shock that yes. anybody could behave so badly as right. it seemed to have to happened. done yes to spit you out what yes uh, and and total and then somebody said to me i was doing a play can you hear me at the back by brian clark 365 performances at the piccadilly theater with Darling, um, Hannah Gordon mm. and Peter Barkworth and Michael Maloney. Michael Maloney, young boy, and I thought, you are going to come and live in my house. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to come and live in my house. And I told him. And I said, I've got a perfect thing. I've got a, a, a top floor. I've got a, 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 a bedroom, a kitchen, a, a bathroom, and you are going to come and be my kids big brother mm. because I needed them to have some male that was stolid mm. and solid and nothing to do with me and my yes. boyfriends and uh, that's what he was Michael Maloney came and lived in our house forever extraordinary so so you get back up you you claw you, you you get back on top you get these big roles they lead to america back to america for the for, for, for the colby's and dynasty um, and sister kate and, 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 and lots of other st yeah. and then films with christopher Plummer and anthony hopkins and then back to broadway and 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 then it's all right isn't it? it's not bad and then back to britain again and, and and i know you really enjoyed doing coronation street didn't you it's, uh, it, 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 it's well uh, it's it's a question of of some people are just very special human beings, and Bill is one of them. This is Bill Roach. Yeah, Ken he's just Barlow. he's just. They changed studios from one place to another, and they had new dressing rooms built. Now, if I'd been with a soap opera for sixty years, can you? I promise you, I would have had a flaming, not just a suite. No. I mean, I would have had a building. A building. Yes. You know, no, I wouldn't. But, you know, I really would have had. A, yes. Not Bill. Didn't even have a bathroom. No. Just not Bill's style. It's the opposite career trajectory, isn't it, in a way? For, for you to have got sort of bounced around in the way that you have done. And then well, someone I, I actually have been very stupid in that I never... Somebody said, what are you doing? A, 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 a daily soap opera, because I did something called Mark Personal. Mm. I said, I'm saving up to have a baby. And they said, but you're a film star. What right. are you doing that for? And I said... Well, actually, I I just want to make enough money to save up so I can have a baby. I didn't I never ne never have thought. Now I'd love to, but it's a little late for career planning now. Well, not necessarily. Which brings <laughs> which brings us neatly, neatly and inexorably to to you've got two films coming out in the next couple of months: Grey Matter, yes, and Forever Young. Yes. How do you pick parts now? Do you pick parts now, or I mean, do you? 
to what? well for a start I'm not keen on the idea of going along and auditioning I didn't think like you would that. be no so, so it's only when it's a complete offer it's a fait accompli um, yes it's when, when somebody says uh, you know th yes. th please come and play we'd love to have you and yes. we'll pick you up in the mornings and we'll give you lunch and you can you know and all that sort of thing um, and this is the money uh, and uh I have worked with some of the loveliest people I've ever worked with, both on Forever Young. Um, uh, Hank Pistorius is just a heavenly uh, director. He's so lovely. It was lovely to work with Die Quick again. Uh, it, it's it was I was Die Quick's best friend uh, right. in it, so I play the best friend role. And unfortunately, my story has been cut to ribbons. Um, uh, because the, the the balance of the film was done the other way, which is a great shame. It's the way it great goes. Shame, sometimes. But it's the way it goes. Never yeah. had that happen to me Probably before. Not really. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Took me till I was seventy five before I could have mine parts cut. <laughs> um, and then, grey matter is one of the most thrilling, fabulous things I've ever done, because I was let out as a grumpy granny who gets Alzheimer's and working with uh, Eloise Smith mm -hmm. who is just a delight and we got on so well and she's this young bright skinny little rawr, and I loved her and she loved me and we 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 jostled as grandmother and grandchild and it was beautiful and uh and Arabella Burfitt Dons was was the her director. first who directed it was her first thing, and every now and again I just scratch my nose and think, I think I'm going to just come in here and say something. And Arabella had such a lot of pictures in her head because she'd done her storyboard mm. so beautifully that if something happened that was amiss, not different from how she had thought but a miss like the the location disappeared yes. or something she, her 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 research had been so perfect that on the lowest budget that anybody could possibly scrape through she would manage to recover and uh, that's what that's who i want to work oh, with people lovely. that that care are greedy for it have done their research and um uh, are determined. I just, you know. I'm well, t tell me a bit more about the role. So, you, 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 your your character uh, has got developing well, dementia. Well, my father, my, f my 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 own daddy, right, um, uh, died with Alzheimer's, and it is it is an appalling thing. Brutal. To to witness, mm. and so I had quite a lot of experience of it and had seen it was it was a very special thing to pull hmm. some of it to me and and um uh be there sorry i'm mumbling because no, it's not. a very hard thing to really well, describe how you are seeing something that you've seen externally and then what you do is you put it inside and i can remember my father being in a state of worry right um and uh that's the thing i think when when you've gone to complete Netherland. Yeah. It's terrible for the people looking after you. But I don't know that it's so terrible internally. Right. But before that, it's awful. Yeah. And so it was wonderful to be just able to be dealing with that. When you're conscious of something being lost, it's it's terrible for you. But when perhaps you no longer, this is what you mean by Neverland, you no longer really know. Gosh. I think you're in another land. You, you, I think you're you're, in, there's another land. Mm. It, and uh, I think there may be a beauty there. I think there may be a, a possibility of a, of a calm and a peace. A zen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can't wait to see your performance in that. Thank you. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's only one step on the road to what will be uh, 
the film that I sincerely hope that I do make. I'm suddenly becoming ambitious at the first time of my life. I mean, I can remember when I knew I had to earn money. Right. And I, and I can remember when I decided to meditate on uh, uh, going uh, to either India or the Far East, yes. and I did. Thank you. Um, but uh, I suddenly think, I really hope that I am able... I, I, I reckon that that's what I'm going to pull now. What we're going to have now is a really... I would like a director to say to me, mm, Stephanie, that is interesting. <laughs> I think we've seen that before. <laughs> Should we have another go at that? Should we have... What do you th Someone who's going to scrape me away and let me out. And the, the enthusiasm is the same as it was when you played Electra. How can it not be? Yeah, James, this is a good life. <laughs> Life is good. Long may it continue. Stephanie Beecham, thank you. Thank you.